Join all of you. We're thrilled that so many of you could join us this morning. I think we thought we'd have maybe 150, maybe 160 people that would come out today, but uh, it's well over 450 people who have come out today. It's amazing what coffee and muffins do. I mean, they just... People say, yeah, I'm here, count me in. But no, this is, uh, again, probably uh, one of the biggest events we'll have all year. So uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for all that you do, being members of the New England Council and finding time to be here today. And while I'm thanking, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to our friends at Fidelity, not only just putting us here together and sponsoring this morning's event, but for their extraordinary support that they have given to the New England Council year after year after year. We are so blessed to have them as members of the New England Council, but more importantly, to have them here in New England. When we talk about corporate citizens, Fidelity is high on the list, always there, but in a very quiet, very unassuming, unpretentious way they don't look for the fanfare, they don't look for the press, but they look at the needs of people throughout here in New England. And chances are pretty good, their fingerprints are right there saying, count us in. So we're blessed. And while we're blessed to have Fidelity, we're blessed to have Pam Everhart. Pam Everhart is on our board, and uh, she is an extraordinary individual, and uh, we are so pleased that she has decided to spend time by being a member of the board. And she's going to introduce, because no one can introduce our guest better than Pam. Pam's from Dorchester. Pam's a neighbor. Is there any? Oh, I didn't know. Oh, I, I didn't know that there were any people from Dorchester here. <laughs> but while I'm thanking Fidelity, let me also say a word about Fidelity being a very generous and uh, uh, giving corporate citizen. I want to thank and commend Fidelity and Pam and the entire team at Fidelity for the recent announcement, Invest in My Education initiative, which will dedicate a remarkable $250 million to support black, Hispanic, and traditionally underserved students as they pursue a college education. Congratulations. <laughs> 2023 has gotten off to a very busy start for the New England Council. This past year, we did over 50 uh, events throughout New England. I think we're on our way to breaking that record this year. We have some great uh, programs planned in the weeks ahead. In New England, we look forward to hosting Congressman Richie Neal, Mayor Michelle Wu, Congressman uh, Joe Courtney, uh, just in the next few weeks. And in Washington, we will host uh, Congressman Jake Auchincloss, uh, Senator Maggie Hassan, Representative Andy Custer in February. And as you may have already seen, we announced our 2023 Washington Leaders Conference, which will take place on May 10th and 11th in our nation's capital. Registration will be open in just a few weeks. We hope that uh, you'll join us for what I promise will be a jam-packed and informative couple of days. As always, you can find more information and register for all of our great events on our website, newenglandcouncil.com. Today, we're delighted to welcome back a great ally of the New England Council, but more importantly, someone who I call my friend uh, for many, many, many years, my neighbor, um, former state representative, former mayor of the great city, and now United States Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh. I thank all of you again for joining us here today, and I am pleased to hand it over to PM Everhart the Senior Vice President of Regional Public Affairs and Community Relations at Fidelity Investments, 
to introduce our guest speaker. Rest is up to you. Good morning. Uh, Fidelity was delighted to host the, a council breakfast back in December uh, with the secretary, and we're so excited to sponsor this one this morning. We're so grateful for all of the work that the council does to help the business community in New England connect with leaders in Washington who are shaping policies that impact our region's economic well-being. Today, we're honored to welcome one of those leaders and one who needs no introduction in this room, uh, given his long history in public service, um, as Jim mentioned. Um, he was my state rep in Dorchester. Um, and <laughs> but uh, before then, Marty, you know, you and I served on the board of the Neighborhood House Charter School uh, in Dorchester. It's a K through one school where many of the students there are black and brown and have significant leads. And, and, and Marty was a true leader in that. You know, there were some tough times there, Marty. You remember on that board, but we got through it. Um, I know we're all proud, particularly those uh, of us Dorchester residents, as Jim said, that uh, Marty has now been named, uh, was tapped as Secretary of Labor. Um, but as long as I've known Marty, um, he's always worked tireless, tirelessly to protect workers, to improve work conditions, and to advance opportunities for profitable employment for all Americans. A few weeks ago, uh, some of my colleagues and I joined Marty on a tour of the uh, renovated World Trade Center. And I must say, as we were walking through uh, that tour on that rainy day, uh, and I thought you were going to cancel, but you didn't, came out. And I must say, you know, all those construction workers on the site, and I mean all those workers, knew Marty. And, you know, they're really happy to see him. And, of course, uh, Marty took time to um, say hello and to shake hands and, um, you know, uh, take photos. But he also took time to engage in meaningful conversations. Just like, exactly. <laughs> Just like he did today. And that's why we were starting 15 minutes late, because he was gay. So, you know, um, I just say, what are your leadership at the department has, has been just um, fabulous. You've engaged with, I know, the financial services industry, listened to our feedback um, on the ESG um, guidance that, that, that was uh, released. So I want to thank you for that. But you've also always engaged with all the other sectors. Um, education is represented here, healthcare, biotech, and many other others in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, uh, for, for your service. So with that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for that. And, and thank you for the standing ovation now in case this speech is really bad. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to thank Pam. Uh, you know, I go back a long way, Pam. Uh, in Neighborhood Child School Board, it was in the very beginning of, of the inception of the school. Uh, and, and it was, uh, those early days were tough. And as it went through, I got a chance to know Pam. And then when I ran for office and state, became a state rep, Pam uh, and her family was a big help to me. So I want to thank you for all that you do. And thank you to Fidelity for sponsoring today and all that you do as well in this, in this. you know, Fidelity is just not just a Boston company. If you don't know, it actually reaches across the United States of America and the world. So uh, I think we're so parochial in Boston, we think like the, you know, the, the national companies are just a Boston-based company. But you actually actually have, they actually have offices. Like when I, when I go to a city and I see like one of the Boston companies in office, I'm like, oh, look at that. that building <laughs> get excited. Um, the, I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to thank all the, 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 uh, the current uh, and former past elected officials. I think the only current elected official in the room, I think, is Aaron Murphy, city council, who like, never stops working. Um, hi, Aaron. She literally goes to everything in the city of Boston every day. So thank you, Aaron. And to my former colleagues uh, and, and friends and past elected officials here, there's a lot of you. And if I stop mentioning one or two or three or four or five or six of you, I'm going to leave somebody out and get in trouble. So, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so I'll come back to you in a minute. Mayor Sullivan's here from Braintree. Where's Mayor Sullivan? Bra uh, Brockton, Brockton. Sorry, Brockton. Sorry, Mayor. 
I was thinking of the other Sullivan when I was saying you, uh, but the Mayor Brockton, who, who actually is, is an amazing guy, I had a chance to work with the mayor uh, in the beginning, well, before that, but in the beginning days of COVID, we had a call every Sunday night with the mayors uh, from around eastern Massachusetts mostly, and, and we were on the calls and talking about what's happening in the cities and towns across the Commonwealth, and we're sharing best practices, and the mayor was an amazing uh, asset to that call because he was talking about working in a, in a community that has so much diversity and really how do we get into communities uh, that, that has language barriers and he was a huge help so thank you Mayor for, for all your work. Um, I want to just also just congratulate a couple people. I want to congratulate Governor Baker uh, for doing an amazing job as Governor of Commonwealth of Massachusetts who served us for eight years and did a really great job. I want to congratulate and, and, and welcome Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, the former mayor. Um, for their work, and they, they have, they've hit the ground running. They appointed an amazing cabinet. Uh, yesterday, they announced Kate Walsh as the HHS uh, Secretary of HHS, which is a longtime friend. Uh, they announced Lauren Jones, who worked uh, in the, our administration, the city of Boston, as the Secretary of Labor. Um, she's going to be working on workforce development issues, and I don't know if Lauren's here, but uh, it's a great, great appointment uh, by, by the governor. Uh, and then also all the other folks that, that they're appointing, so I want to wish them well, because I know uh, elected representation matters, particularly to this group here in this room today, because it is important who's, who the leaders are and how they move our city and state forward in our country, quite honestly. Uh, I want to just take a moment also to, because I, I didn't get a chance to do this, uh, express my condolences for a, a, family, a friend uh, of me and a friend of a lot of us, Senate President Tom Birmingham, uh, who passed away. Um, when I was a state rep, uh, Tom was the Senate President, uh, and Speaker Finneran didn't realize at the time that I had a pretty good hook into uh, Speaker Birmingham. So when I couldn't get something, and which was very rarely, by the way, but when I couldn't get something from Speaker Finner and I'd go over to Senate President Birmingham and get it in that way. So I, wanna, I, I just want to uh, say thank you. He was an amazing labor leader and, and uh, was, had very strong views, ran for governor, and really represented uh, this state well. Uh, so I want to um, just pass along my condolences to his family. Uh, and I want to just, I have to mention Jim Brett. Um, I always, we always joke about it. You know, I, I followed Jim Brett in the legislature. Uh, he, uh, he, I held the seat that he had. Uh, we both come from literally the same neighborhood. Uh, I grew up on Taft Street, he grew up on Grant Street, which is literally across the, over Dodd Ave. You cross over Dodd Ave, you're on Grant almost. Uh, his parents came from Ireland, my parents came from Ireland. Uh, he was part of St. Margaret's Church, I was part of St. Margaret's Church. And, and we have very similar backgrounds. And, um, you know, just, just over the years, him helping me along the way and moving forward. And, uh, you know, I didn't think of it till recently, you know, down in Washington, uh, when I, when I, you know, um, I think of the New England Council, and when I'm talking to elected officials, Democrats, particularly Republicans, and I'm having a hard time kind of um, getting getting through, sometimes I throw out the New England Council in Jim Brett's name, and they all know him, and they all are like, oh yeah, and, and I explain the relationship between being a mutual friend, and it opens doors for me. So I want to thank you, uh, Jim, for opening doors down in Washington as well, for, not just for me, but for the country, because it is about uniting the country. And what the, Uni what the New England Council does, and, and having your breakfasts and everyone part of this, you unite the business community and, and the rest of the community. So thank you, Jim, for, for your support and friendship. So. PM talked a little bit about, and Jim talked about my, my opportunity. I grew up in Dorchester, as you all know. I'm not going to go into a whole spiel again. Uh, I'm not running for office, so I don't have to do all that. Um, I served in the legislature for 16 years. Um, it was an amazing opportunity. Um, and and as, I, as I did all those roles, I ran the building trades in Boston for a couple of years as well in my 2011, 2013. And, and what it did to, for me was really prepare me for the next role I would have. Um, in being mayor of the city of Boston. And I had no idea that it was going to prepare me, the mayor of Boston, to be the Secretary of Labor for the United States of America at the time. So when, when I ran for mayor of Boston, people, you, some of you in this room, actually thought I was too close to the unions and thought I'd be terrible for business and awful for the city of Boston. So I want to thank you for that. Um, <laughs> And, and I certainly, you know, we were talking one day at the campaign office about, you know, what do I, how do I do this? How do, how do I, how do I get my message across? They're saying I'm just a labor guy, and, and I'm not just a labor guy. I'm like, I'm a, I can be a business person. I can do this and that. And, and what we decided to do is, rather than run away from it, we, we decided to embrace it. And, and what I said was, I wear my, my labor credentials as a badge of honor. 
And I talked about, I made no secrets about who I was and what I was all about. And, and, and certainly, as we continue to move forward, we proved the media and, and folks that they were wrong and it was nothing uh, further from the truth. I was committed to, as mayor of Boston, and some of my team is in this, off, in this room today, and I'd love to mention you all, and I, I'm not going to, but thank you, because you're amazing. Uh, I look around, some of, some of the folks in my office are still working for the city of Boston, and some aren't, they've moved on to other places, but I couldn't have done this without all of you and, this, and the, the, rep, the people that I work with in this room today. So we worked to, to, to commit to uh, forge strong partnerships. We brought people together to listen to their views. We found common ground. And just some of the accomplishments that we were able to, to, to accomplish, our economy added in seven years 140,000 new jobs in the city of Boston. We approved $48 billion in new development. We approved and under construction over 50,000 units of new housing. Government, our city government earned a perfect AAA bond rating for sec seven consecutive years in a row. That's the first time that's ever happened in the city of Boston. We grew our tax base by making historic investments in our neighborhoods. We fully renovated libraries in Roxbury, Dorchester, Rosendale, Copley Square, and other places. And the importance of that is really understanding to make those, those investments. We built brand new high schools and created new high schools that are being built right now. The Dearborn STEM Academy, Boston Arts Academy. Great, the best public arts high school in the United States of America is in the city of Boston. The Josiah Quincy School, which is under construction now, and it's great when I come home, I see that, 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 that building going up and how big it is and how great it looks. And the families there had the unbelievable Boston Arts Academy and the Josiah Quincy parents, they were gonna have, there was a plan to build it over the highway and it couldn't work and the, the parents were patient and now they're getting a beautiful school. The Carter School for kids with special needs, right now the school holds about 31 students, that's all we can have. We're gonna build one of the best schools in the country for kids with disabilities. With the sale of Winthrop Square Garage, we're able to invest $30 million in Franklin Park and also Boston Common, building those two gems, those two jewels in our city and making renovations. Complete renovations of neighborhood parks. We, we were par building parks all over, all over the city of Boston because when I was a Little League coach and I'd go to a field in the suburbs and I would see the field there, I would think to myself, wow, this is amazing. It looked like Fenway Park. And then when we came to Boston, we, we, in some, not all parks, but some of our parks, they were, they were city parks, as it was supposed to be. But I wanted to make sure our kids, our kids got better parks and the investments we made to make sure that we, they have a trip, not to have a AAA bond rating, but a AAA park system as well. And that's what we're, we're working on now, and that's what's happening right now with the city of Boston. Built new firehouses for the first time in 40 years in Charlestown and Roxbury, and right now Meeting House Hill, they're building a new one. The first full renovation of City Hall Plaza in 50 years. I just want to take a minute because these are important. The reason why I'm telling you about this is that the architect of City Hall came into my office one day and he sat across from me and, and Joyce brought him in and he was talking about the building and he said to me, City Hall is unfinished. And I thought to myself, no kidding, it's unfinished. <laughs> and he said, we started to, to, to put together a group of folks, Pat Brophy led the, led the, led the way and and we're building, you know, and the city will continue to do this. The mayor will continue to do this, build around the park, but open up the plaza for the community. If you go by it today and you see the plaza, it's different than it was before because it's a space for the neighborhood. And it does make the beautiful, the, it will make the build, building beautiful and incredible. So there's opportunities there. But this all happened because of the people I worked with every day. We were able to house 2,500 homeless people into permanent housing. We were able to end veterans' chronic homelessness, something that we're doing right now, again, in the federal government working on. Our Boston's Way Home Fund built hundreds of, hundreds of new supportive housings. These are generational investments, but none of this building, none of the, what I just talked about, could happen without partnerships. The neighborhoods, the private sector, the state, labor, and people in this room. So it took, I took what I learned as mayor with me and all of the lessons we learned to Washington when I was asked by the president to be the Secretary of Labor. 
I work with a president and I work with a vice president who approach our nation's challenges the same way that we work here in Boston, by uniting the country and moving forward together. I just want you to take a step back, and some of you have heard some of, these, some of this speech before, but I just want to, I think it's really important. I want everyone in this room to take a step back to where we were two years ago and think about where we are today. A week ago, we hit the two-year anniversary of the Biden-Harris administration. Two years ago, 18 million people were out of work or on unemployment benefits. Those numbers are real. The unemployment rate in the country was 6.3%. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses had closed their door. Tens of thousands in Massachusetts have closed their door. And thousands of people were dying every day from COVID-19. President Biden took office with a pledge to unite our country. He set out a vision for relief and recovery through the American Rescue Plan, the first piece of legislation that he filed and passed. He made vaccines universally accessible, along with testing and also PPE. We got support to families and to businesses to reopen our economy all across this country. And he said, we're going to build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. What he means by that is back in the day, you heard about the trickle down economy, that if you do really well here, it's going to trickle down to everyone. And it didn't trickle too far down. And how do we create a, an opportunity from the bottom up and the middle out to give people a pathway, an opportunity in every community? So far, the results are pretty clear. The numbers are pretty clear. We've added 11 million jobs. We've had the two strongest years of job growth in our nation's history. The unemployment rate is at 3.5%, a 50-year low. Unemployment in the black community, Latino community, people with disabilities are near historic lows, although it's still too high in the black community. 5.7% is one of the lowest numbers on record, not quite the lowest, but it's still too high. It's double that of white, it's double that of almost every other number. We have work to do. We've seen nearly 10.5 million Americans start a business when people talk about where the worker shortage and where the workers are, 10.5 million Americans who used to work for somebody decided to go out and start their own business. That's some of where people are right now. They're out there trying to make it work. It's, been a, it's also been two years, I would, I would say a good two years for business. It's been a two, good two years for working families. We got our supply chains moving. Inflation has come down. Inflation is still an issue. I'm not saying it's not. But for the last six months, we're seeing inflationary pressures come down. We're seeing gas prices come down. And we've transitioned this recovery into stable, steady growth. It's also important to understand none of this was by accident. It wasn't inevitable that we'd come back. Two years ago, the forecasters and economists said unemployment will remain high and full recovery is years away because of the, the effects of the pandemic. It took deliberate policy and choices to move us in a better direction. It took a deep commitment and the ability to work with Congress in a very diff difficult political environment. And it took a belief that we can do great things together as a country and move our country forward. It's also important to know that this administration is really just getting started. The bipartisan infrastructure law so far has invested $185 billion in 6,900 projects across the 50 United States, 50 states in the United States. There are roads and bridges, airports and train stations, clean drinking water, electric vehicle charging stations, affordable high-speed internet that bring equity to communities, good jobs, workers, and growth for opportunities in every community in our country. The Chips and Science Act is revitalizing American manufacturing. We already have over $300 billion of investments by private companies that they've announced that they're going to invest in manufacturing, $300 billion in the United States because of this piece of legislation. Those investments are creating good jobs in places and communities that need them the most. If you look at the pictures of parts of the Midwest and parts of our country where manufacturing was kind of the driver in those communities, where they lost the steel mills and they lost the mills, those mills are now being replaced with chip manufacturers in some places, and we're creating opportunities to bring back manufacturing back into this country in a big way. We're making sure that our supply chains will continue to remain resilient. And American, America in, is the leader once again in the technology that drives the modern world. This month, the President passed the Inflation Reduction Act. It actually went into effect. It expands health insurance and affordable medications for millions of Americans. This is something that we all, as elected officials, we all talk about. We're going to lower prescription costs. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we mean it. The President did it in the Inflation Reduction Act. It launches the biggest investment in clean energy in our nation's history, reducing carbon emissions by 40% by the year 2030. When people talk about the environment, when people talk about clean energy, 
We've talked about it. People have said it. Previous like the officials have said it. Activists have said it. For four years, we weren't in this space because we had a president that didn't believe in global warming, and even though the sea level is rising up over the shoreline here. And this president passed the largest investment in the history of the United States of America in clean energy. It's not only been historically strong two years for our economy, the administration has laid a foundation for a new era of American industries and American workers. Fundamentally, the president's economic strategy is about creating good jobs with equity and access to all our communities all across the country. And a large percentage of these jobs do not require a college degree. These, tr this work is truly about rebuilding the middle class. Then at the Department of Labor, what I've learned as a state rep, what I've learned as the head of the building trades, what I've learned as mayor of the city of Boston, we're thinking about how do we create a, and play a central role in this. And the Department of Labor is playing a central role in this issue, in this movement around the country. At the beginning of the year, we launched a good jobs initiative. It's a collaborative effort across the economy, across the cabinets. I work with my partners in the cabinet to make sure that our new federal investments are creating good jobs, making sure that there truly is a pathway for women into industry, construction and other industries. Make <laughs> making sure that communities of color around the country, including right here in Boston, that are left behind in every other investment aren't left behind. Making sure that we respect and don't forget our veterans who fight for our country and put their life on the line for us to make sure that we're safe. We're working to make sure that people who need a second chance, a lot of us in this room needed a second chance and maybe a third chance for opportunities. We want to create those opportunities. And something that's... And something that's near and dear to Jim Bright is making sure people with disabilities aren't forgotten that they have a chance to go to work and work with all of us in our offices. We work with employers. It's not a top-down approach. It's working with employers. Many of you in this room and around this country asking employers to come to the table and help us. How do we, how do we attract people? What do you need? How can we help you? How do we do this? How do we do this collectively together? We're working on looking at whether it's flexibility and paid leave. We have it here in Boston. It works. Companies that offer paid leave have better retention and better attraction opportunities for their employees. There's no lie. Just look, ask them. Ask Levi Strauss. How do you, how do you keep your employees? They offer paid family medical leave. And, and is there abuses? No, there's no abuses. They're happy. People are happy working for the company. It's thinking about those opportunities. It's training programs, creating pipelines. It's also about understanding how to operate in a global opportunity in global world and making sure we have conversations. Last week I, I, was in, I was in Davos, Switzerland, the first time I was there for the World Economic Forum. I fit right in. <laughs> you can imagine. They were, they were very excited to have me coming in, sitting in there. Um, no, all seriously, we had a good time. Well, it was, it was, it was I wouldn't call it a good time. I had good meetings. Um, we had discussions. I met with the top CEOs, international CEOs, uh, about the future of work and other folks that were there, other, other ministers of, of labor from, from, from Italy and France and India and other countries around the globe. We discussed what the future will look, looks like. We, every country is battling with what we're battling here in the United States of America and how we develop the talents that different companies and industries need. I made a point to, 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 talk, to talk about that, to talk about growing our labor force. And I talked about, more importantly, we need to address inequality in a meaningful way, not just in the United States of America, but around the world. And leadership needs to come from across every sector that we have. That means business leadership as well as government. Labor needs to be at the table. It's, you're at the table here in Boston, but around the country, labor's not at the table all the time. We need labor at the table. We need nonprofits at the table. If you look around this room today, you have business, you have labor, you have nonprofits, you have community leaders, you have elected officials, you have everyone in this room today. And, and, and if I wasn't speaking here today, it was a different speaker, you would have the same group of people in this room today, understanding the importance of collectively working together. These are issues that we can only solve by working together. So I got a chance to visit companies in Switzerland and Austria. I went to Austria afterwards, where labor management collaboration produced long-term solutions for the talents they need. I saw apprenticeship programs that start young people in high school on paid pathways into good careers. We have an opportunity in America right now to build a system like that, to meet the challenge facing both workers and employers. 
And this is a priority of mine. I just want to tell you one quick story. So I was in, I was in, um, it was in Austria. We're at a training facility, and we were walking in there. And there's a 15 year, a couple, a bunch of 15 year old kids there. 15 year old kids there. They're in their first year of apprenticeship. The, st the system's different than we have here in the United States. And I said to the young man, I said, "Well, how, you know, what are you doing?" He said, "Well, I start over here on the computer, and I learn how to code, and I learn how to use the specs to build a a a, a program." that then I take the program over to the 3D printer and I implement in the 3D printer and then I, I print something off the 3D printer. So he said, give me an example. So he showed me how he, he designed a nut and, nut and bolt. He brought it over to the 3D printer, he put it in and, he, and he, he built a nut and bolt on the 3D printer. He's 15 years old. And, and I thought to myself, if I sat and listened to this guy, kid and shut my eyes, I would have thought he was a man. And this is a 15 year old person. I'm thinking like the kids in our country are losing out on these opportunities. So we really have to think about apprenticeships and pathways into careers. Many of your companies here uh, that are here in this room today, because you, you, somebody, a couple people already grabbed me about the need for, for more workers. Well, if you get a 15 year old kid of 16 or 17, 18 that knows nothing about your industry, but you get them into an apprentice program, and all of a sudden now they're in an apprentice program, and somebody asks them on the street, what field are you in? I'm in the field of finance. You just now hook them into the business because of the apprentice program. They might not know much about finance, but they're in the industry. People want to be part of something. Registered apprenticeships is something that certainly I worked on here as mayor of Boston and, and head of the building trades, Lou Anton Ellis, one, local 103 was here, and Lou was, 103 was a huge part of this uh, in, in creating building pathways, uh, a program when I was head of the building trades, Operation Exit when I was the mayor of Boston, working with businesses that said we want to help invest to make sure we get people opportunities into these programs. Apprentices offers tremendous value to workers. We know from the labor movement, from the building trades, when you think about construction and apprenticeships, we have the best trained construction workers in the, in the world here in the United States of America because there's a $2 billion public, pri not, not public, private investment with labor management corporation in the building trades to create training funds to, to, to put people on a pathway when they graduate and they go through the program, they're making great money and they're making a pension and they're building America. So why not take that model to other industries around the country? Apprenticeship provides workers with paid education, new skills, good careers, and opportunities for advancement. And we have been accept we're, we're working right now in the Department of Labor, and we've been, we've been somewhat fortunate to, to bring this, this into new areas, from accounting to information technology. It is great value, especially right now, because businesses need a pipeline of skilled workers. Under President Biden, we've invested over $400 million in registered apprenticeships. We're expanding apprenticeships into new industries. And we've set a goal for over 1 million apprenticeships in the next 10 years in the United States. We should blow that number out of the water, but that's our goal. If we truly want, if you truly need a workforce that's prepared for you, that number needs to be a lot higher than that, but we're going to step with that number. We're designing apprenticeships to advance equity for women and workers of color, and we're leveraging apprentices to meet the needs of national challenges from strengthening our supply chain to addressing labor shortages to bolstering cybersecurity needs. Partnerships is what, it's what makes apprenticeships work. So I invite any employer here in Boston or across the country to partner with our registered apprenticeship program that we can create a pipeline of talent for your business. It's not about you, me, it's about you. It's about making sure your businesses and your industries have the people that they need moving forward. The bottom line is that we're in a moment of tremendous opportunity. But it's also a moment of change. It's important for leaders in every city, state, and region to look and see what that means. I talked about investments that are happening across our country, and that's tremendously important for regions and, and cities that have been have gen generation of disinvestment in. Not here in the city of Boston. We went through that time already. We want to make sure that as we travel the country, as I travel the country, it's amazing to see how welcome a single new factory or a rebuilt bridge can be for a community and for their pride. In our city, we look out every window, we see, we see something happening, a building, a crane, a bridge, a road, something being built here. I think we take it for granted sometimes, but it's not that way in the rest of the United States of America. So we will be stronger as a country when we're working people in every region feel they have great opportunities near where they live. But it's also a critical time for states that have been successful like Massachusetts. Like financial advisory said, past performance does not guarantee future results. How'd I do, Pam? <laughs> we can't take our success for granted, and we can't take our eye off the ball. It's true, we have terrific infrastructure in hospitals and universities. We have highly educated workforce. We have a history of making smart bets on the future from, in, from investments in infrastructure projects to life science initiatives to workforce development programs. 
But just like President, with President Biden's leadership, success in Boston and Massachusetts looks pragmatic policies and dedicated collaborations. We need to continue to work together. That's an approach we have to continue here in our region, in our state, in the region of New England. And the New England Council is a big part of that as well. And I believe we need politics or partnerships now far more than ever. There are always going to be disagreements in politics. There are people in this room that when I was a rep and you were a rep, we disagreed. But that's okay. But we need everyone to be rowing in the same direction. And that was the difference when I was here in Massachusetts. We were moving forward. We need to be a region that's competitive, where it's good for businesses and people to come and invest in. We need a place where working people can thrive. And we need a place where people of all races and backgrounds feel welcome and included, not just in the workplace, but in the communities and the neighborhoods. That's what a true partnership looks like in the 21st century. We do have tough challenges ahead of us in housing, in transportation and equity all across the United States of America. I know from working with people in this room and many others in this city and state that you have and we have here in this area what it takes to meet these challenges if we work together. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Jim Brett, thank you for the opportunity for me to come and address the, the New England Council today. Thank you to my friends in this room for all that you do for our city, for our state. Thank you for all that you did for me and my administration, whether it was as a rep, as a mayor, as a building trade person. I truly, truly, truly um, appreciate it. And the last thing I'll say, um, whenever I give a speech, I have to run up by the, the, the lawyers just to make sure it's okay. <laughs> Not the speech, but the, the location. So the other day, the, 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 the person I had to run up by said to, uh, said to Becca, Becca, the schedule, who I had in City Hall, you know, we have to cut down on these Boston speeches. <laughs> I'm like, well, they're really not Boston. I, I spoke in the New England Council, I was in DC, so I'm getting some grief for coming to Boston, but the way I look, I'm spreading the word about the president, right? Just tell him. <laughs> Okay. Wow. Man from Davos has never changed. He's never changed. You know the the uh, the secretary was very kind in saying that uh, we have. Uh, you know, we have a mutual connection growing up in the same neighborhood, same school, same church, same playground, parents coming from Ireland, you know, his parents from, from uh, Rustmuck and Galway in the 50s, and my mother and uh, father from Sligo in the 20s. And uh, Pat was pretty similar. Up until one uh, point in our lives, we both ran for mayor. <laughs> and uh, one was elected. So um, that is the big difference. But uh, he has, uh, whatever he's uh, achieved, he's obviously been very successful at it. But um, we have chance to, a, a couple of questions, um, and I know a few people asked for photos, so we'll try to do that as well. Um, I'm just going to tell you a quick story on, on our very special friend. And they're here today. Um, St. Mary's Center for Women and Children doing extraordinary work. They, they do extraordinary work in helping women to uh, reconnect and uh, re-enter the, uh, the community. And uh, the work that they do is truly extraordinary, to say the least. And it's, it's a, a organization that's deep in, and close to, uh, to Marty. But we had a meeting three days after Christmas just to talk about how they're doing at the, uh, at the center. And, and the mayor uh, was there, uh, Walsh. And um, I said to him when we left, I said, now where are you going? And he said, well, I said, you, you know, you want to go to McKenna's? You want to have, you want to have breakfast in the neighborhood? And he said, no, I'm going to meet a, a young lady from uh, Guatemala who is newly arrived here in the city. And she lives in Dorchester, but she doesn't really have any of her own housing. And I'm going to try to get two things for her, housing and a job. And that's what I'm going to do this afternoon. 
it just tells you something about the character of the individual, that he's never lost the connection of helping people who probably most people walk by. And he stops and tries to say, how can I help you in my position, state rep, mayor, secretary of state, or good neighbor? And that's what he does day in and day out. And that's why we have the crowd that we have today. People see something special in him, and we're all so proud of him as he succeeds. Now, the first question I just want to ask you, Matt, what were you thinking? Um, <laughs> what, were, what were you thinking when you heard that your name was mentioned with a group of maybe three or four others to be the chief of staff to the president of the United States. My reaction, and some of my neighbors in Savin Hill said, not surprised that his name was mentioned with a handful of others, because the president, the president feels so close and so comfortable with him over everyone else. So I said, I'm not surprised, but it's, it's, a, it's a credit and another accolade that I would give to him that somebody said to me one day in Washington, a United States Senator, Republican, said to me, I'm not really, not really pleased with the cabinet. I said, I understand, Republican, Democratic cabinet. And then the senator said, but there's one member I really, really, really like. And I said, who is that? She said, Marty Walsh. I said, now why is that? And she turned to me and she said, Marty's there to serve the president, not himself. It says it all. So, so we have... We have time for one or two questions, so if anyone has a question, they already gave a big shout out to the uh, IBW 103 people, which we love. I don't know if there's any other union. My, my poor nephew, the plumbers, but everything is 103, 103. So Marty loves 103. We all love 103. Young lady in the back. Okay, we have a mic. Oh, I have you want to identify yourself? Uh, my name is Karen Walker, Vice President of Development at Century, Community, uh, Century Care Alliance, one of the largest nonprofit serving agencies in New England. Um, my question, I want to go back to that apprenticeship. I have my colleague here from Quinn Sigamond Community College. We uh, attempted to do an a apprenticeship program, particularly around our essential workers in the health care industry, um, human services in particular. Now, with employers, there are tax breaks, but when you're doing it as a nonprofit, that opportunity is taken off the table. And we had the right partners at the table. The challenge we have is twofold. Because there aren't tax breaks the, it, for a nonprofit that are already underfunded already, um, that, is a, that was a challenge. But we took the bite. The other challenge is because of the people we're looking to serve um, rely on public assistance. And so they were caught in a paradox. If they participated in the apprenticeship program, a great program, it gave them an associate's degree, a certificate, an associate's degree, a guaranteed job, and they would have to give up their benefits. And so they couldn't continue because they couldn't afford childcare in particular. And so when you're looking at apprenticeship, I, I guess I have a, a request and a question. Would you look at the opportunities for essential workers who also um, in that um, field that we need employees, we need qualified employees, would you consider the challenges of equity, pay equity, and then have you thought about how you might offer apprenticeship to um, companies that um, cannot benefit from the tax break that yep. it offers? Thank you for the your comment and question, everything you said. Uh, anyone who doesn't understand that, you're absolutely 100% accurate in everything you just said. Um, first of all, there's a woman to your right right now that snuck up behind you. She's going to give you a card, and we're going we're gonna to hook you up with, um, we're gonna hook you up with, with our Office of Apprenticeship. Uh, we, we are thinking that. We're looking at all those different areas about we had to deal with that with Building Pathways. Um, building Pathways was folks that lived in public housing 
that would then get into the building trades and all of a sudden now they're making so much money that they can't live in public housing. So we, we worked with the city of Boston, I wasn't the mayor at the time, and we worked with the Department of Housing and Urban Development to come up with, a, with an exemption so people could stay in their homes so they got in their feet and they got out of, they left the projects and bought their own homes in often cases. So uh, we absolutely will work with you on that. And also just, um, I spoke at the Mass Hospitals last night, just one quick example of apprenticeships. In this country, we have a nursing shortage, as you all know, while you're hearing about it. Uh, the nursing shortage really isn't real until five years from now. That's when the real shortage is coming because the nurses are going to be aged out. We're, see we're seeing a nursing shortage today because of um, COVID, mostly. Uh, but, but it's going to be further down the road. We're going to have a worse nursing shortage. We also have 66,000 people on waiting lists to get into nursing programs across the country. So when you think about the industry, it's not like truck drivers where we can't find the truck drivers. It's an industry where people want to be nurses, but we got to get them into nursing. So the Department of Labor is partnering. We took $80 million from a fund to create an opportunity for a pathway. And the biggest challenge, and you mass can tell us, uh, the chancellor, about they don't have enough instructors because instructors, uh, there's not enough instructors to instruct students. So we're working right now with, with, with states and, and, and cities and hospitals across the country to create this program. And here in Boston, Congressman Steve Lynch was, out, was able to get $3 million to UMass Boston for the nursing program. Um, for, I believe, simulators in, 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 in nursing. So, you know, UMass Boston is one of the greatest nursing programs in the country. So we need to make sure that they can take as many kids into that program that want to be there. So that's kind of my two answers there. Uh, just real quickly on Jim Brett's quick question there. When I, I was on a plane, I was about to, I was in, I was flying from, from, uh, from Austria to, we flew from Austria to London because our flight from Austria to DC got canceled. So I flew from Austria to London, from London to Boston. And I was about to board the plane in London, and I got a text from somebody to say, you might want to read this. And I read the New York Times article, and I'm looking at the article, and I'm like, it says, you know, uh, Ron Klain to step down. And, and, you know, the names mentioned Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, Jeff Zients, and a bunch of other, and, and Tom Vilsack. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, like <laughs> so now I'm going to be on a plane for eight hours. So, and I have no Wi-Fi. And, and so I, I texted one or two people. Um, and, and then I took off because I got it right when I took off. When I landed, it was 68 texts. People congratulating me. A couple of people looking for jobs. Uh, it, was, it was great. Boston, you got to love Boston. I want a job in the White House. Yeah, we'll put you right in. Oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah. Okay, we have a chance. Maybe one more uh, question. Yes, sir. You sure. Just identify All right, thank you. So, so I get questioned. The first Friday every month is, is Jobs Day. And, and on Jobs Day, I go out in, into the country, and the president does as well, um, but I'm on all the different TV stations, all the national news outlets talking about the economy and the unemployment rate and how come it's low and why we're doing this and great jobs. And they come back with, you know, inflation. The Fed wants to, we should have higher inflation, higher um, um, unemployment and this and that. And I push back on that. And I talk about great goals, gr uh, gains in, 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 in wages for workers. Isn't that bad for the economy? I'm like, well, I don't know if it's bad for the economy, but it's good for the worker to get more money. So we talk about that. But when you think about, when I think about where we are at this moment in time, and I just want to you know, paint a little bit of a picture here for you. So we have, we have about 62.7% participation rate in the United States in employment. It's usually around 67%, which is roughly about, I know there's about 5 million people that aren't participating right now in the workforce. And you think, okay, where are they? And you think of, the, let's, let's think of the challenges for a minute. We lost over a million people to COVID-19. Roughly 40, 42% of those folks that we lost were of working age. They weren't older people that were retired. They were working age people. So we lost those folks out of, out of the workforce. Last year, in 2021, the, the rate for overdose, overdose, overdose deaths was roughly about a million people. When you think about addiction and, and, and substance use disorder and mental health services, I'm just, I'm guessing this, 
If every one person loses light, there are five active people out there. Those folks aren't in the workforce. So you think about that. That's millions of people out in the workforce. And then you think about the pandemic when the pandemic came and our system of child care. You know, we think we have a great system of child care in Boston, Massachusetts, and we have a decent one, but we don't have a great one. We don't have that, that automatic child care for everyone. If they don't get a voucher, they can't go to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester. If they don't have the ability to pay, they can't really pay because they're paying their entire salary. So a lot of mothers and parents are out of the workforce because we don't have good, strong, quality child care. A lot of people are out of the workforce because they're taking care of a loved one or a parent and they don't have the ability to put them in or they're afraid to put them into an assisted living facility because those facilities are short of workers as well. So when you think about the obstacles, and then we also have people that, that are underskilled, that, that, that don't know where to go to get a job and don't know where to go to get a career. So we have a perfect storm. So when you think about the challenges in front of us moving forward, they're challenges, but they're opportunities. The president filed a bill um, to, to really deal with uh, child care in Build Back Better. It didn't pass. But we have to deal with child care as a nation, as a state, as a city, to think about how do we make investments in child care so the folks that are working in those facilities are getting paid good wages and good money so that they can support a family, but also support other families who bring their kids to be taken care of during the day. When you think about workforce development job training, you know, as a state rep and the reps that are in the room, you know, I used to go to these programs, we'd be, we'd be training people. It needs to be more than just training people. It needs to be partnerships, companies. You need to have a partnership with an organization on how you're going to recruit workers to your organization. And that, if that means work incorporated, if that means goodwill, if that means whatever it might mean, St. Mary's, you know, these are, pro, these are places, St. Mary's Women's Infant Center, it's not the name anymore, but I still call it that. St. Mary's has, St. Mary's has women up there that are looking for work. That are opportunities. They're not looking for a job that makes $15 an hour. They're looking for a career because their life has already been challenged enough that they need to get on their feet and move forward. If you're a company in this room and you're looking for workers, you say, I want to do workforce development, job training, apprenticeships, you go to St. Mary's. And you go out and recruit people. And that's how, that's how we're going to get our economy back up and running. It's going to be about investments. And it can't just be the federal government. You know, when people say this, you know, the government will, will do the apprentice program. I don't think we should do the apprentice program. I think businesses should do the apprentice program. I think we should assist the businesses because they're the employees that are going to work for businesses, make the investment. If you're here in this room today and you're like, well, we're not going to do that, go to Europe. Go to Austria. Go to Switzerland. Go to Denmark, go to Copenhagen. Go see the factories and manufacturers there. Their bottom line is great, they're doing well. But they also have an apprentice program where they're training people to go into, and job training people to go into those industries. There is no industry in the United States of America that we can't have apprentices. There are kids right now, I, I said this, you know, there are kids right now, maybe not right now, but a little later today, if you go to Dorchester Avenue, you go to Mattapan Square, you go to Nubian Square, you go wherever, there are going to be young people there looking for an opportunity. We need to go to them and find them to bring them in to let them know it's possible. Because it makes a difference. I will tell you the power of apprenticeship. This will be the last story. When I was a state rep, I forgot this story. Uh, a, court, a, pro, a probation officer in Dorchester, Dorchester Court who worked for Kevin Fitzgerald, my dear friend Fitzy, uh, Leon, was a probation officer and he had a, he had a young kid that was on probation, and he needed to keep a job. And if he didn't keep a job, the judge was going to throw him back in jail. And he got a job at McDonald's, he quit. He got a job somewhere else, he quit. He couldn't find a job. So Leon called me, because I was running the building trades at the time, and I had just started building pathways. And Leon said, can you, will you talk to this kid? You know, he's trouble, he's in the community, he's always in trouble, can you do this? I'm like, yeah, let me bring, I'll talk to him. So he comes in my office, and you know, we, I forget the meeting, but he told me, he told, he told the story. And he said, you know, I, I said to him, are you willing to work hard? He goes, yeah, are you willing to, to do whatever? Yeah, are you willing to stay trouble? Yeah. So I bought him, put him in Building Pathways. And when he finished Building Pathways, after six weeks, he got a chance to go to the Pipe Fitters Union. And he became a pipe fitter. And he, he graduated the program five years later, and now he's a journeyman pipe fitter. He's eight years in the Pipe Fitters Union. He's never been arrested. He's never gone back to jail. He has two kids. He's married. He bought a house. And he told that story at the White House. In the power of apprenticeship, the power of giving somebody an opportunity. Now, the story doesn't have to be that drastic. 
It can be a kid that's hanging out somewhere right now that doesn't have a pathway. It's about opening the door. I do what I do because I enjoy helping people. You do what you do because you enjoy your industry. Take that same interest that you have in being successful, in making opportunities for your company and making money. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not the person that criticizes CEOs. I don't care about that. As long as you create pathways and give that, give it away, pay it forward as they say. Create those opportunities. Because I guarantee you at the end of the day when you put your head in the pillow, you will feel an amazing amount of joy and, and, and just accomplishment. It's better than passing, it's better than creating a product that's gonna make gazillion dollars when you can change the life of one person. And that's what we need to do in the country. It's a long answer to your question, but the answer is we can do it. We just need to set up the system that works for people. So thank you. Sure. We got some pictures over here. Mm -hmm. Just a couple.